that. I appreciate it. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter number 11. Acts chapter number 11, as we look there this evening, I want to talk to you about our theme for this month, that not only are we disciples, but as disciples we are Christian. And uh, as we look at this, uh, as we sat down and went through each month uh, prior to the new year, uh, we were selective uh, and uh, careful to pick verses and a sub-theme that we would be able to define throughout the year. So most of you say, well, I know what a Christian is. Well, we're going to talk about that in relation to the three places that it's mentioned in the New Testament and uh, talk about that for here just a few moments. But uh, the term Christian can be used to describe the followers of Jesus, obviously, and it would imply the teachings of Jesus as well. If you were to ask people, and uh, some have done that, they've asked people just out in public, what's a Christian mean to you? Well, there's a lot of different things that people believe about what a Christian is. For those who have had negative uh, experiences with Christians, they, some have said Christian are just mean people. And that was their perspective. That was their experience. Some have said, well, Christ, Christians are just another religion. Some have said Christians are followers of Jesus, as we know. This is a uh, true teaching. Some have said Christians are just another denomination of religions throughout the world. And so we have many people with many different thoughts about what Christians are. When we look to the scriptures, uh, there's no doubt that uh, there's much more description uh, to what is a Christian. But as we look in the scriptures prior to being mentioned here in Acts chapter 11 and verse number 26, uh, those who are Christians were uh, once called uh, believers. They were called brethren, disciples, the church. They were called Galileans. They were called Nazarenes. There are many different ways in which people tried to describe those who were followers of Jesus at that time. And we notice here in Acts chapter 11 and verse number 26, if you'll look at that with me, and we can read down uh, the very last portion of Acts chapter 11, verse number 26, the last sentence actually, it says, and the disciples were called what? Christians first in Antioch. This is the first place that they actually were given that name Christian. And so it's very interesting that took place here. So there's things that happened prior to this, but prior to this, uh, they really didn't have a name attached to them other than followers of Jesus, uh, no doubt Nazarene, Galileans, other things. And they were associated to where these groups of people who are now starting to teach the principles that they heard of Christ, uh, that's, that's how they were identified. So let's have a quick word of prayer, and then we'll jump into just three simple points tonight about uh, what it means or, or that we are Christian. Father, we ask now that in the time that we have that you would please just guide our hearts into your truth. May we look at the term Christian not just as a title, but that we look at it as an actual badge of honor and something that reflects much more than just your name. Uh, we are to reflect you. Uh, as your followers, and we are to be represent, representatives of the truths that you had set forth and uh, the, the, the truths that we still try to implement and follow as believers today. And so we ask that you would just encourage us as we look to your scriptures and see what others, what was said of others who followed your principles and your teachings. May we glean from them and still put it into practice today, as I know many of these dear people are so doing. So we ask for your blessings now and your understanding of your words. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So first of all, I want you to notice that we bear the name of Christ. When you look at the term Christian, you can't help but looking in there and seeing the word Christ or the, the name Christ. Christ was uh, the term given to Jesus as the anointed one. He obviously was the one called to be the Messiah, and the, the term Christ means anointed, and he was a, definitely a special uh, person, We know that he is the God-man. And so when we look to the name uh, Christian here in our text, in Acts chapter 11, verse number 26, there are several things that are stated prior to verse number 26 that give us a little more insight. So go back with me, if you would, to verse number 19. I want you to look at verse number 19, Acts chapter 11. And I'm just picking some portions so we stay close here, so we're not jumping all over uh, the New Testament at this time. But notice back in Acts uh, 11, verse number 19, now they which were scattered abroad upon the, uh, excuse me, upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, traveled as far as Phenis and Cyprus and Antioch, 
the preaching, preaching the word to none but, only, uh, but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, and when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and great numbers did what? Believed and turned unto whom? The Lord. Then tidings of these things came to the ears of the church that was where? In Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto whom? The Lord. For... He was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto whom? The Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek who? Saul. This is an amazing portion of Scripture when you really think about it. And as you consider, the next verse tells us, and they were called Christians first at Antioch. And so we look at what preceded that, and I won't take time, but we can go all the way back to the day of Pentecost where uh, the uh, uh, apostles at that time were endued by the power of the Holy Ghost to preach the gospel. Hundreds and a couple thousand people received Jesus Christ as they heard men speak in their own native tongue and they heard the gospel clearly. And from there we know that there were, uh, at, at that time, it was mainly the Jews that the gospel was going to first. But we also see that in Acts chapter number 8, Philip preached to a man who is known as what? The Ethiopian eunuch. And here is a man traveling to Jerusalem from Ethiopia, and he was on a mission to go there, and he was reading the book of Isaiah, and Philip asked him if he understood the things that he read, and he said, how can I except someone show me? And Philip jumped up and showed him, and here's a man converted to Christ, and he said, what does hinder me to be baptized? Now here you're talking about someone who immediately understood the significance of what took place in his own heart and desired to follow, be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ because obviously either that's what Philip relayed to him or that's what he was taught somewhere else and he was curious about this newfound religion, this newfound practice, this following this man named Jesus and understood he wasn't just a man, that he was also God and he died for the sins of mankind and he saw that from Old Testament scriptures and so we understand with Philip helping him to understand and preaching to him Jesus Christ, we see a convert that was not a Jew. We see a convert that was a Gentile. We can go fast forward there, the next chapter, chapter number 9 of the book of Acts, and we find a man named Saul. And Saul was doing what to those who were of the church of Jerusalem? He was persecuting them. And what we see in chapter number 11, verse number 19, was the people were fleeing Jerusalem because of Paul's persecution, especially of the death of one Stephen. Stephen was a man that had the Holy Ghost upon him, and he preached, and he was unashamed of his faith in Jesus Christ, and they stoned him to death there, and the coats of, of, of the people who stoned Stephen were thrown at the feet of Saul. Very interesting, and then... We, we come to Acts chapter number 10. In Acts chapter number 10, remember, Peter has this vision of unclean meats. And if you understand, to a, a religious Jew of that day, they were not to eat anything unclean. And God gave him this vision and even said to God, no, not so. And God said, don't call what I have dubbed clean unclean. And he was giving him an illustration of going to the Gentiles. And a man named Cornelius, a Gentile captain, general if you would, Peter was to go and explain to him the gospel, and he and all those in his household trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Now Gentiles are becoming Christians, are getting saved and becoming followers of Jesus Christ. And then we move to chapter number 11, and we realize what is taking place here is that the persecution has now caused Christians to flee Jerusalem, and they're going to the outermost parts of the known uh, area to them. They make it all the way to Antioch. And as they hear of people being saved in Antioch, all this terminology was new back then to them. This was all stuff that they, it was happening so quickly. They say the estimation of the church in Jerusalem was about 25,000. That's a large group of people converting to following Jesus Christ. And then from there, the persecution spread out and people were going to, from city to city to city. 
those who were believers were telling others what happened in Jerusalem and explaining about what took place in their hearts when they trusted Jesus Christ, their personal Savior. And the Spirit of God was so evident in the lives of these people that something changed and they had the joy of the Lord that more people wanted to find out what this was all about and they wanted to be followers of this Jesus Christ. And no doubt the Holy Spirit of God was convincing them of this truth as He still does today. There's no reason. You could sit down and explain the best way you could, you could possibly explain. You could be theologically correct, dot every I and cross every T, and you could be explained to someone who does not, is not pricked by the Spirit of God, and you just gave the best lecture of your life, and it fell on deaf ears and a deaf heart. But when that Holy Spirit of God convicts them of their sin, and they understand that they are in need of a Savior, they understand they need to ask God for forgiveness of sin, that's the moment where that person finally gets it and they trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. You don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to be someone that can dot every I and cross every T theologically. But if you can present the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ to someone and the Holy Spirit would prick their heart, immediately that person can trust Christ and call on Him to be their Savior. We understand that that's what was going on. These new converts to being disciples, to being brethren, to being the church, to being the followers of Jesus Christ, were now being spread out through the countryside. They were going from miles and miles and now preaching the same gospel that they received and telling people it changed our life spiritually, it'll change yours too. And many more people were coming to know Jesus Christ. All that was taking place, and when you get to chapter number 11 of, of the book of Acts, they understood that they were bearing the name of Christ. In verse number 19 again, they went preaching to these different cities, and they were preaching to the Jews only, but yet more and more people, even Gentiles, were hearing of the gospel and coming to Christ. Oh, by the way, back in Acts chapter 8 or 9, Peter went to Samaria. Samaria was a half-breed uh, type of a, a town. They were not received by the Jews, but yet in Samaria there were people being saved, both Jew and Gentile being saved. We understand that the gospel was going forth and people were being converted to Jesus Christ. And we come to Acts chapter number 11 and verse number 26, and we see that there they were first called Christians. So what is it that made these people, what is it that caused others to call them Christians? We don't know who came up with the term. Were they sitting in a church service and they were just talking amongst themselves and, and somebody just finally says, you know, what are we going to call ourselves? You know, we're not Jews technically. I mean, we have now Jews and Gentiles. We have these different people. What do we call them? You think somebody in the crowd just says, how about Christians? You know, how about Jesus freaks? How about, I mean, who knows? Well, most scholars think that the term was actually dubbed upon them, not taken by them themselves, but it became something that caught on. Maybe it was somebody that said, you know what, those are those people that follow that Jesus. What do they call them? Oh, yeah, the Christ. And so somebody says, well, we're the Christ ones. We're the Jesus ones, and that somehow just caught on, and yet here it says they were called Christian first in Antioch. And so they bear the name of Christ, and it's not actually a name. We, have, we, we associate it with his name, but it's a title. Jesus the Anointed, Jesus, if you would, the Messiah. And so we find here that they were known for preaching Jesus first to the Jews, that's what this term Christian means at this particular time. They were known for preaching Jesus. Verse number 19 tells us very clearly. They were preaching Jesus to the Jews. Not only that, but they were preaching Jesus to the Gentiles. Others were hearing it. We see that from previous chapters, that others were hearing it as well. Not only were they preaching uh, Jesus, but these were ones who were persecuted by the Jews in Jerusalem, particularly by the Apostle Paul. Not the Apostle at that time. There was a man named Saul. And so we find that they were persecuted people. They were people who were fleeing for their lives and for their livelihoods. We also see that they cared for one another's needs. Look over here to chapter number 27, or 20, chapter 11, verse number 27. And in the days, and in, in these days came the prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. So they wanted to come and check this stuff out for themselves. Were there really more people being saved at different cities and around? And so we have these men traveling to Antioch to find out what else is going on there. And there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit of God that there should be great dearth, that means a famine, throughout all the, all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, who are the disciples? 
Christians. Christians, the brethren, the church of that day. That's, that's who we're talking about here. Then the disciples, every man according to his what? Ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Here was a great opportunity for these new converts to Christ and these uh, seasoned converts to Christ who were fleeing persecution. They heard what was going on back in Judea and they said, you know what? There's going to be a great famine that's coming over, the, over this earth according to this prophet. And they said, let us help. Let us send back provisions. Let us send back money so they have enough to supply for the need. Here is one of the great first efforts, if you would, for this new church plant in Antioch. Hey, we want to help out the brethren. Hey, we want to do a missionary offering to send back to these people so we can help in a time of their need. And so we see that not only did they preach Jesus to the Jews, they preached Jesus to the Gentiles, they cared for one another's needs, they took up a love offering for the persecuted back in Judea. We know by our theme verse this year in John 15, verse number 34 and 35, that by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. How so? If ye have loved one to another. And so here we see that we bear the name of Christ, and the name of Christ, no doubt, signifies those who preach Jesus, those who care for others' needs, those who are not ashamed of being uh, represented by Christ, and those who are willing even to suffer persecution for the cause of Christ. And that's what we see just here in these few verses about those who were Christians. They bear the name of Christ. I want you to notice, secondly, that we bear witness to the gospel of Christ. Turn with me to the second place of mention of Christians in Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter number 26. And we find the second place in the New Testament of three only that we see the term Christian used. In Acts chapter 26, and I'll begin first of all in verse number 1. And we have a man named Agrippa. Agrippa was the last Herod. The Herods that were set up were puppet kings, if you would. They were Jews, or not technically Jews, half Jews, but they were set up by the Roman government in order to rule over the Jews. And here we have one that, at this time now, Apostle Paul was converted. He's now a true believer and a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now because of his imprisonment, he has to come before Agrippa because he was a Roman citizen. He appealed to be able to speak before Caesar. And so now he has to go through several steps to get there. And so now he stands before Agrippa. In verse number one, it says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth his hand and answered for himself. Now, if you've never seen this, it's kind of neat. Sometimes you can watch the old movies, and they do a pretty good job reflecting or demonstrating what happened. Back then, they would allow a person accused, if he was a Roman citizen, to stand on the, if you would, like the courthouse steps. As he would stand there to answer for his crime or give his testimony, he would beckon the people. He would beckon the people to quiet down that I'm getting ready to speak, and he would, he would get their attention. And this is exactly what we see here. It's, it's being portrayed out. He's in front of Agrippa, but he has to now get the, the crowd to listen and get the judges and the, and the different ones there to listen. And he's getting ready to give his defense of his faith. This is awesome. Most of us would love to have an opportunity like this. If they brought us up on charges of being a Christian, let's just give them both barrels full. Amen? If they're going to put me in prison and they're going to take me away from my home, then, hey, you're going to get it all and I'm going to go back. I'm going to get historic on you and I'm going to make sure you understand the gospel clearly. And then when I'm done with that, let the chips fall where they may, but I'm going to do my best to present God to you properly at that moment. And this is what Paul's doing. He's beckoning them. And Paul was an orator. Paul was a well-skilled, well-versed man in the scriptures. And he was someone who, no doubt, uh, knew how to manage a crowd. And so while he's there, he starts in verse number 2. He says... I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee, 
to hear me patiently. Boy, he's setting them up. <laughs> he's first loading on the charm here, bragging on them for a little bit. But he's getting, he's now, if any time a speaker says, now be patient as I start my introduction, look out. I don't tell you that at the beginning of my messages because I want you to stick it out, okay? But here we go. He's, he says in verse number four, my manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation of Jerusalem, know all the Jews. In other words, they know me. They know my, my family. They know about my upbringing. They understand who I am. There was no question that Paul was a Jew. He wasn't just some rabble rouser. He wasn't somebody who just all of a sudden jumped on the scene and, and wanted to cause trouble. Here was he was given his pedigree of who he was so they would listen to him speak. So he had authority in the sense of being a Jew, but he was also a Roman. And now he's able to give his uh, dissertation of, of his life, kind of setting him up to understand who he is. Verse number five, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sects of our religion, I lived a what? Pharisee. Now you couldn't get more strict than that. Paul was saying to those who were his accusers, I am one of you, and for those of you that are not a Pharisee, I am more strict than you in our own religion. He was laying it on. He was letting them know, this is who I am. This is who I, uh, how I was raised. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our 12 tribes instantly serving God day and night Hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be uh, thought a thing incredible with you that uh, God should raise, what? The dead. He's starting. For any, anybody who is a believer in God, he said, why should anyone, especially you, King Agrippa, think it incredible that God could raise the dead? If you're a true believer in God, you know he has that ability. And he's getting ready to give history here about Moses, and he's going to go wax eloquent here and go on. He does a masterful job of giving his defense, and he does it so where he's hitting historical facts, he's hitting his own Jewishness, he's hitting on uh, their belief in God and their fathers, which he was all of that. Now we skip down here, if you would, for the sake of uh, time, to verse number 14. He says, and when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard the voice speaking unto me. He's giving a salvation testimony now and saying unto, in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Now think about this. Who was Paul actually going after? He was going after Christians. He was going after those who professed faith in Jesus Christ. Who did Jesus say he was going after? So he was going after Jesus. He was actually persecuting Jesus. See, this is important for you as a Christian to understand. When you are persecuted for the faith, they're persecuting God. When you take a stand for what's right, they not only have an issue with you, but they have an issue with God. That's why it should embolden you as a Christian not to get... Uh, sarcastic or mean-spirited with people, but you need to understand there is one person in this whole entire universe who will always know if you are standing for what's right in the eyes of God and will always be there, whether it's at that moment or down the road, to protect you or to reward you for taking a stand for Christ. He will make sure. He will make sure. Jesus Christ will make sure that he takes to heart when you are treated poorly for him. We go on here in verse number 16. But rise and stand up upon thy, uh, thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a what? Minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they might receive forgiveness of what? An inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Here he's quoting Jesus' words and Jesus again is giving him purely the gospel message. 
Listen again to verse number 18. To open their eyes, indicating that those he was talking to, as the Apostle Paul has given his own testimony, open the eyes of the blind spiritually. They may be very religious. They may be Jew from their upbringing. That's what Paul was saying. Remember, he gave his own pedigree. But here now he's confronted with God face to face and God is telling him, Paul, I'm opening your eyes, you're blind spiritually and I want you to preach the same message to everyone else who will listen. And we notice he goes on to say, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of their sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith, not by works, that is in me. Who's the me? Jesus Christ. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them in Damascus and Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then uh, to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do the works meet for repentance. For these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and went out to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the, uh, the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as, and as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth that these things, before whom I also I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a what? Christian. Almost, Paul. You got me right there, Paul. You're a very eloquent man, Paul. You're very convincing. You almost got me to be a follower of this, belief, of this Jesus. It's one of the saddest verses, I think, of many, but this is a very sad, sad testimony. That a king, a puppet king, seeing the demise of his own country, seeing the futility of trying to fight against the Roman government, enjoying the spoils and the riches of high taxation on his own people. Yet in his heart of hearts, I'm not sure what Paul knew at this moment about King Agrippa's personal belief. Maybe there was a private conversation we're not privy to. But he made a very direct statement to King Agrippa saying, and you know it. <laughs> That's basically what he said, you know it. And yet, he said, Paul, almost. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. The second main point here is we bear witness to the gospel of Christ. And when I was in college and seminary, we had to take this portion of scripture and dissect it. And I think it was in a homiletic class. And I heard as I was studying, I think this is one of those portions of scriptures that they actually say that attorneys will use to teach some of their students how to defend something. It's kind of fascinating that, they, that the Apostle Paul, being such an educated man, would be used as an illustration, even in the secular world, for how to give a defense of what you believe. And so we find here that he did exactly what he was called to do as a Christian. He bare witness to the gospel of Christ. And I would say the second main point here is that you, if you are a Christian need to be able to bear witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Study how Paul presented it. Study the many other verses that the Apostle Paul gave us and Peter and, and others in our, in our uh, New Testament. There are many ways for you to present the truth of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Many verses you can go to to talk about sin and the destruction of sin and what the hopelessness and the helplessness of someone who does not know Christ. And yet, 
you and I may still have the same results with some that almost you persuaded me. But then you might have the joy of having some say, yes, I believe. Yes, that makes sense in my heart and my mind. Yes, I'm willing to trust Christ as my Savior. We are to bear witness of the gospel of Christ as the Apostle Paul did. That's the second place the term Christian is mentioned. Now turn with me to 1 Peter chapter number 4. This is the third and final place in our New Testament that the term Christian is used. 1 Peter chapter number 4. And I want you to just understand the background here. The Apostles Peter was writing to Christians who were being persecuted for their faith, suffering for their faith. And I want you to notice in verse number 16, specifically, it says, Yet if any man suffer as a, what? Christian. Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. If a man suffers as a Christian, now that doesn't mean that just because you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you do something wrong that you can claim persecution. (laughs) That's not what it means. Just because you are a Christian and anyone does anything to you, even if you're guilty, that you can claim persecution. That's not what he's talking about. For the rest of this portion of Scripture, go back to verse number 7. We'll see that it's talking about several different things in regards to persecution. Notice in verse number 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of what? Sins. Here the Apostle Peter was so gripped with the fact that he thought God was coming back very quickly. If you read Paul's writings, he thought so too. They even tell us that's how we're supposed to live. Don't get so attached to this world, it's very short. Well, 2,000 years later, we're still preaching the same thing, but God never told us when He's coming back. But we're to live like He's coming back tomorrow. That doesn't mean sell all your possessions and and just uh, live on uh, on faith alone, but it does mean that we need to be looking up and saying, okay, Lord, is it today? Why? Because it gives you a perspective that's different than those who are living for this whole life. I hope it's in my lifetime that Jesus Christ comes back. I would love to see it in my lifetime. I love to know that I was a part of the crowd that got raptured off the face of the earth. But I also be, love to just know that, hey, we did everything we could to the day that Christ took us up to preach the gospel and to help people come to know Jesus Christ. It gives you a different perspective that I can't just go week after week after week just doing my own thing. If I really believe Jesus come back at any time, then I'm going to start living a little differently. Not because I'm scared of him, because I love him and I want to help his kingdom expand. I want to help his message get out. I want to see more people come to Christ. But I've made the mistake many times where I live thinking, well, it's probably not going to happen this week, this month, this year. God says it could any moment happen. We just don't know when. But we live sometimes like it's not going to happen, and therefore we're not as aggressive. We're not as fervent, I should say. We're not as prayerful. We're not as studious. We're not as proactive in our faith because we just live like it's probably not going to happen in our lifetime. Yet we see from Peter, we see from uh, Paul and others in their writings, they expected God to come back any time. Verse number 9 says, Use hospitality one to another without grudging. This is the opportunity for you, for me, to have people over, to take care of people, whether it's out at a restaurant or it's in your home, to be a place, to be a person who's willing to spend time with people and to minister to them, to share, if it's not the gospel, maybe it's with other brothers and sisters in Christ, to help them to be comforted or help them to grow in their faith. This is something we should be very willing to do as followers of Jesus Christ. Obviously, during their time, Paul, the, Peter was emphasizing the need for this because of the persecution, the suffering the people were facing. Oftentimes, we hear of someone who lost a loved one or someone who's got into a, a car accident or someone who's had a financial reversal, and for a while, people will, will rally around and try to cater to them, bring them meals and help them out with certain things, and then after time, it kind of fades off. 
which you can't do it forever, but we understand that there's a time where people are trying to help and encourage and cater to people who are going through a difficult time, but we recognize that in their day, they were suffering because they were Christians. That's why they were suffering. They were being persecuted because they had a faith in Jesus Christ. Their stores were being shut down. Their businesses were being taken away from them. They were being taxed excessively. And they needed to reach out in love to one another. They needed to provide for one another. They needed to have people move in with them in order to take care of their needs because nobody else would do it. They were the off-scouring of the earth. They were being purged. And so because of suffering, Peter recommends to them that they use hospitality one to another without grudging. Don't be offended. Don't hold it against others. Verse number 10, And every man hath received the gift, so even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it. He's talking about now spiritual gifts and the, the ability to, to teach and to preach the word of God with accuracy, with clarity. Verse number 12, he mentions, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of whose sufferings? Christ's sufferings. Because they were being persecuted for the mere fact that they were believers and followers of Jesus Christ, he said, you're partakers of Christ's sufferings. Now notice he qualifies it in verse number 14. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Your suffering glorifies God if it be that it happens to you. Notice verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a what? As a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other man's matters. So the idea is that, hey, if you're suffering genuinely because you're a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, and you're teaching and preaching the gospel, and you suffer that, he said, then God gets the glory in you. But if you're doing it because you're committing crimes, you're suffering for crimes, you're suffering for being a gossip, you're suffering for some other uh, sinful act, he says, there's no glory in that. That's not what a Christian represents. That's not how you're supposed to act as a Christian. You say, wait a minute, we're suffering. What's wrong with us having to steal to, to get food? What's wrong with us if we have to kill in order to stay alive? Peter is saying, that's not what a Christian's all about. That goes against every piece of pride in our nature to just take it, to just suffer. Verse number 16, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be, what? Ashamed. But let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin where? At the house of God. And if he first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? In other words, in the fairness and the justice of our God, he judges his own, he chastens his own first. And if that's true that God chastens his own, how much more severe will he chasten those Judge those who are not his own someday. And verse number 18, if the righteousness scarcely and if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well doing, as unto a faithful creator. If you go through suffering, and commit your life to Jesus Christ. Commit it to God. Let Him be in charge. And so we understand that not only do we bear the name of Christ, but we bear witness of the gospel of Christ, but we also bear the sufferings of Christ. And if we bear the sufferings of Christ, it brings glory to God. And we are not to retaliate. And we are not to get into trouble for sinful behavior. As Christians... We are to honor God and glorify God with our life.
Peter was so convinced that Jesus was going to return soon that he told them to not live like this was going to be a forever place for them. Live like Jesus Christ is coming back today. And I just wonder if we as who name the name of Christ and we say we're following Christ, if we live with that mindset, how different would our daily life be? What would we do differently tomorrow if we believed Jesus Christ or thought Jesus Christ could come back? How different would your attitude be at work? How different would your conversation be? How different would your prayer life be or your reading of the scriptures or your witnessing to people? What would motivate you to be more Christ-like than to know that Jesus could come back today? And as Christ-like ones, we are to represent him to all that were around us. As disciples, we are Christian. I hope that defines it just a little bit more for you. 